heads in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we are deeply grateful for all that has transpired during this meeting. We thank you for the singing and the music, for the testimonies we have listened to. You have spoken to us in so many ways, and now we are here open before you to hear what you have to say in your own word. And we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, make the message clear to us all. May the Holy Spirit make your word understandable. May Jesus be glorified and praised, and may our hearts be warmed. Amen. First Peter, the fourth chapter, and the first verse, Peter's first epistle, chapter 4, verse 4. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Arm yourselves with the same mind. Or as the New English Bible puts it, you must arm yourselves with a temper of mind like his. In other words, this text written by Peter, disciple and apostle and follower of Jesus, exhorts us as Christians to let the mind of Christ be our weapon, to let the mind of Christ be our armor. The concept of the Christian being a soldier of Christ is both old and scriptural. The armor of a Christian soldier, as described by Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, is well known. We uh, are urged to have our loins girt about with truth, to have righteousness as our breastplate, to have the preparation of the gospel of peace as shoes on our feet, we are asked to take the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and to have as our sharp and powerful sword the word of God. Now here in our text today, we are exhorted by the Lord's Apostle Peter to arm ourselves with the mind of Christ. Christ's mind is unselfish, full of love, Yes, love that is willing to give its ultimate sacrifice, the sacrifice of suffering. Throughout the ages, this has been the best weapon of the Church of Christ. Whenever the Church has turned from this spiritual armor to the use of merely human or material weapons, the result has been complete failure. The history of the early salvationists is full of examples of how the mind of Christ was displayed and how effective that weapon was. Dr. W. E. Sangster writes in one of his books about the early day salvationists. He relates an, an experience of his father who had watched the uh, rise of the Salvation Army and had observed the attacks upon the early Salvationists by the skeleton army, which had been organized by those who violently opposed the young Salvation Army. Outside the Eagle Tavern in City Road, London, a Salvationist was offering the gospel of Christ to the people when a half-drunk man came out of the public house and with one savage blow, knocked the preacher from his box. As he fell, the Salvationist struck his head against the curb with such force that everyone thought he was dead. Then he came round, staggered to his feet, and so as through a mist the man who had struck him, the fellow was now almost sober with fright. Raising his hand in love, the scientist said, God bless you. 
and resumed his address. Sangster's father, who witnessed the incident, declared that at that moment he knew that the skeleton army was defeated and that these new soldiers of the cross would march around the world. And march they did. They did indeed march around the world. And one blessed day in 1883, they reached the west coast of the United States of America. And they are still on the march, on the onward march. They now witness for Christ in 85 countries using 112 different languages. But everywhere they are still armed and must be so with that weapon, the mind of Christ. Let us look a little more closely at that weapon and ask ourselves whether we indeed are armed as we ought to be. The mind of Christ, my friends, is a caring mind. It is a mind for others. His mind should color all our attitudes to our fellow men, both in our everyday dealings and with regard to up-to-date social issues and intergroup relationships. It would no doubt be a very healthy exercise to stop and ask, what Jesus thinks of many of the important issues of this day. I wish we could read his mind on, on the arms race in the world, where there is now a sufficient amount of nuclear weapons to destroy the human race, and when, where new weapons are manufactured and stored day by day. I wish we could read his mind with regard to unemployment, that frustrating, demoralizing, dehumanizing phenomenon of our day. What is the mind of Christ with regard to racial and uh, national differences, with regard to sectarian prejudices, with regard to discrimination and violence of many kinds? We have an insight into his thinking in the New Testament. You remember that it is said that he must take his way through Samaria, that province which was despised and hated by his own people. He must take his way through that land because he had a message to proclaim to a woman whom even her own neighbors looked down upon. No social discrimination, no racial discrimination, no national discrimination. The love of Christ is an all-embracing, caring mind. To what extent do we possess that mind, which is unselfish love and caring for others? On the gravestone of the uh, famous Swiss, Swiss educationalist and philosopher Heinrich Pestalozzi, there is the following inscription. Everything for others nothing for himself. That is a true description of the mind of Christ. To what extent could those words be used of us, of our attitudes, our choices, our decisions in life? It is said of the army mother, Catherine Booth, that when she learned of the deadly nature of the disease that was to kill her, she knelt down before her, beside her husband and said, do you know, William, what my first thought was? My first thought that I should not be there to nurse you at your last hour. Yes, what a heritage is ours. The mind of Christ has been the weapon of our founders and our pioneers and all those who have gone before us. And there would be no Salvation Army today had that not been so. Love has been described and defined in many ways, but Christian love is something very practical, very practical and down to earth. And one of the best definitions of love is, love is to allow yourself to be disturbed. 
Jesus did not, did not live in pious seclusion far from his fellow men. He lived among the ordinary people of his day. He was often disturbed by individuals and by the mass of people who needed his help. He allowed himself to be disturbed, and so must we. Not only was he disturbed in an outward sense of the word, but often he was disturbed in his spirit. Now is my soul troubled, he said on one occasion, recorded in John 12. And in the chapter prior to that, there is uh, a mention of him that he, was, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled at Lazarus' grave. He was troubled in his spirit. That's a quotation from the 13th chapter of John. And yet, and yet, the mind of Christ is also a serene, serene mind, a mind at peace, a balanced mind. Look at Jesus sleeping in the boat when his disciples are all panicking. The fishermen panicking in the storm. The carpenter from Nazareth sleeping peacefully. Jesus possessed peace of mind because he was in his Father's will. His life was deeply rooted in God. He experienced the truth of the prof prophetic words, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Yes, the mind of Christ is a mind set on God, concentrated on his will, trusting in his omnipotence, a mind that takes into consideration both his precepts and his promises, that fully accepts both his commandments and his comfort. Do you and I possess something of this blessing? the mind of Christ. Salvationists, we must be armed with this weapon in order to be victorious in the fight today, in order to be truly successful in our ministry as witnesses for him. Where is the battle's front today? Where is the battlefield? No skeleton armies attack the Salvation Army today. The most prevalent attitude, as I see it, is a general approval of our social program and a kind of benign indifference to our spiritual message. But the fight must go on. The message must be proclaimed. The gospel of Christ must be presented to the people. Our, evan evan our evan evangelical program must go on in our citadels and temples. Our open-air ministry must be carried on. Our publications must be distributed. Our ministry of the helping hand among the needy must continue. But the most important battlefield is everywhere where the individual Christian, the individual Salvationist lives and works in the home, in the neighborhood, in his place, in her place of employment. And that is where that most important weapon is needed, where the Christian must be adequately armed, where the mind of Christ should be displayed in words and actions and uh, attitudes. I call upon all Salvationists and other Christians present in this meeting and everywhere, to yield to the inspection of the Holy Spirit. Is your armor in order? Is it complete? Have you buckled on the belt of truth? Have you put in, on integrity as your coat of mail? Do you have the gospel of peace as shoes on your feet? Have you taken up the great shield of faith? Have you taken salvation for your helmet? Do you have the word of God as your sword? And above all, are you armed with the mind of Christ? In Romans 13, Paul exhorts the Christians of his day, it is far on in the night, day is near, 
Let us therefore throw off the deeds of darkness and put on our armor as soldiers of the light. And he goes a step further when in the same chapter, in the last verse, he says, let Christ Jesus himself be the armor that you wear. In his blessed name, salvationists and friends, I challenge you all to make a new commitment to the Lord and to his service. Put on the Lord Jesus as your armor. Be armed with the mind of Christ. Towards the end of his life, our founder was almost blind. But nevertheless, he carried on with the work and uh, one day he was interviewed by a young journalist. And the young journalist looked at the old saint of God and said, General, uh, can you tell me what is the secret of the success of the Salvation Army? And the old general looked at the, uh, the young man. He could hardly see him through the mist that hindered his sight. And he said, young man, the secret of the Salvation Army is the fact that when I was 15 years of age, I decided that God shall have everything there is of William Booth. Later on, his daughter Evangeline, well known in this part of the army world, commented on, his father's, on her father's words and said, yes, she said, my father did indeed say at the age of 15, God shall have everything there is of William Booth. And she added, he never, never took anything back. Have we take, taken something back? Is our commitment full today? Are we ready for the fight? For the second century? The Lord has great things in store for us. And he has a great job for the Salvation Army of this territory. Are we armed with the mind of Christ? Let us pray. And we shall sing a chorus that, has, that was inspired by William Booth's commitment. All there is of me, Lord, all there is of me, time and talents day by day, all I bring to thee, all there is of me, Lord, on thine altar here I lay all there is of me. And in an outward sense there is an altar here. It's been erected here by loving hands for our benefit. And so I invite you, salvationists and friends, right away, come and make that fresh commitment and say once again, all there is of me, Lord. Now just stand to your feet and come as we sing.